It's time for the Russ Belleville Show's Cannabis Q&A with Dr. Mitch Earlywine. Dr. Earlywine is a professor of psychology at the State University of New York at Albany and a leading author and researcher on cannabinoids and health who pins the Ask Dr. Mitch column for High Times Magazine. Get your questions ready in our live chat or call in to 971-533-7111 now. All right, welcome back, everybody. Half past on a Wednesday, and you know that means it's time to get your medicine with Dr. Mitch Earlywine, medicine of knowledge here to help fight for the end of adult marijuana prohibition. Dr. Mitch, welcome back to the show. Thanks for being here. My pleasure. All right. We got all sorts of stuff that's stacked up since uh, we've been away for a while, and I uh, want to remind folks we'll take questions in our chat room uh, at, uh, at Ustream. You can also call us live at 971-533-7111. We always let Dr. Mitch open the segment, though, with whatever's the latest in cannabis science. Well, Russ, as you saw, there's a uh, alleged mental illness linked to heavy cannabis use article that came out relatively recently. And I just want folks to be careful when they interpret this because there's a lot of self-medication going on with cannabis. A lot of folks who may have some mental illness symptoms turn to cannabis before they're diagnosed, and then that tends to boost this idea that somehow cannabis is a source of mental illness. Right, right. It's the old chicken and egg phenomenon. These guys have uh, demons in their head, and they're trying to take care of them by you know, maybe smoking a little herb, and that gets confused with causation. Exactly. So just because something comes first doesn't mean it's necessarily the cause. And in fact, when you look closely at some of these data, it's uh, often not even clear that the cannabis use came before the symptoms. Hmm. Okay. So it, it seems to me we get this this same a variation on this theme every six months or so, uh, like a wave. Uh, is this them just trying to find harms for cannabis to justify the the continuing prohibition? As odd as it seems, this actually goes back to the 1890s. Hmm. For some reason, people have always thought cannabis is a cause of mental illness. But again, we, we've got self-medication going on for literally 100 years. I, I think the clincher here, too, is there may be a subset of folks who are at risk for some psychotic disorders. And if they use cannabis heavily early in life, they may be more likely to develop those disorders a little earlier than they would if they hadn't. We've talked before about how cannabis use really isn't for teens. It's not for adolescents. But again, the idea that cannabis is somehow causal in all forms of mental illness is just a big exaggeration. All right. There's there's a couple other studies I want to get to, but we've got questions coming in on the chat room. And, and this one I think is really good because it's uh, it fits with a story we told earlier in our news segment about the Czech uh, Republic and their pharmacies now that are allowed to sell medical marijuana. And Runaround666 wants to know uh, he, he, that the Czech Republic has psoriasis as one of the qualifying conditions. And we've not seen that listed anywhere here in America. So what are your thoughts on a psoriasis and medical cannabis use? The curious thing is skin conditions were actually originally uh, a recommended uh, thing for cannabis going back uh, at least to uh, ancient Roman times. So, I mean, we're talking literally hundreds of years. There's a general drying of mucous membranes that cannabis is notorious for. And the idea that it would uh, dry skin and help essentially uh, uh, psoriasis symptoms increase is not inconceivable. Obviously, there aren't randomized clinical trials on this, but I'd actually love to see uh, one of these happen. Psoriasis is an easy thing to kind of minimize, but in fact, folks who have it, uh, you know, severely tend to find that uh, anything that can relieve their symptoms can be a huge help just to uh, daily functioning. Yeah, I, I have two people in my life, a really good friend and the girl who works down at the convenience store, both who battle uh, psoriasis. And uh, unfortunately, the girl that works at the convenience store is drug tested. So we she has tried. We gave her some of the cannabis salve, and she's tried it, and she thought it was remarkable. But she was so afraid to do it anymore uh, that, that she's back to just using uh, the conventional therapies, which uh, are not having much effect. And what makes me sad about that is what would she really mess up at the convenience store? Is she going to put the candy bars in with the ice cream? I mean, is it really this outrageous horror if she were using medical cannabis? Yeah, exactly. And, um, well, let's get to uh, another one of the studies that I had uh, pulled up. This one I saw coming out of Medscape, uh, and it was a... It was, a, uh, it was originally published online in Diabetes Care, 
and it was, uh, the, the lead on this is chronic cannabis smoking induces subtle metabolic changes that include increased visceral adiposity and adipose tissue insulin resistance. Uh, and reading a little further down in it, it just talks about basically how it seems pot smokers get more belly fat, which um, I guess I can attest to. I have to admit it's a little disappointing. We have seen cannabis-related slowing in metabolism from Fulton's work all the way back in the 80s. That slowed metabolism and increased food consumption is bound to turn into some adiposity somewhere. It looks like uh, that little fat around the belly seems to be the way it goes. It's, it's sad to think that a beer cut could also be a cannabis gut, but at least these data are consistent with that. I'd like to see something like this replicated, though, because I feel like they ran a whole lot of statistical tests in this data set and that this may have just been a uh, type 1 error, just something that came out as a fluke for all the different stats they happen to run. So I don't want to make too much of this yet. Is this uh, also possible, you know, looking through this, it says they had um, 30 cannabis smokers uh, matched with 30 controls. So, I mean, is, is 60, you know, a large enough number to make much out of? The funny thing is, is usually when you have a sample that small, it's a big effect that's getting detected statistically. But uh, again, we don't have a huge difference here. We're not talking about pounds and pounds. They measure the uh, the uh, fat in the stomach using these MRIs. They're not perfectly reliable, but they're definitely something going on there. But yeah, as you mentioned, with the sample this small, we really do need to see a replication. There was other evidence in here um, that was interesting. The second paragraph says, there is no evidence, however, of an association between chronic cannabis smoking and more severe metabolic impairment, no hepatic steatosis, insulin insensitivity, impaired pancreatic function, or glucose intolerance. So with respect to people who might be pre-diabetic or worried about diabetes, what does this tell us? In truth, the, my concern is always that uh, cannabis does enhance appetite, and we just want to make sure anybody who's using it has a nice lean protein source around and doesn't turn to the Twinkies. But even if, uh, even if you do, it's not as if you're going to be suddenly insensitive to insulin as a result of cannabis use alone. Okay. Another question from our chat room. Uh, James Seatown wants to know, what type of research will we see in Washington and Colorado now that it's legal there, considering that it's still illegal under federal law? Well, I have to admit, I envy those guys. Um, so if they're not applying for federal funding for their research, their institutional review boards and ethics boards for research will probably loosen up on the idea of administering cannabis in the laboratory and give them the chance to really ask all the questions we've all been dying to know for years and years. I'm imagining the more pragmatic things will have to do with cannabis and driving. We're already seeing small samples that uh, the impact of cannabis on driving is not what we had all feared. And I'm um, uh, also hoping to see some more medically oriented things, including some more data on cannabis and pain, and uh, ideally some, some interesting studies on cannabis and creativity, which I know we've talked about in the past, but uh, we just don't have a big enough set of studies to really draw any neat conclusions about that yet. All right. Let's uh, go back to some studies that I were, was looking up. I, I found three here that I wanted to talk about. And I want to remind folks, too, you can get your questions in here by calling in 971-533-7111. Or you can get them into our chat room. We'll answer them that way. Or if you just want to keep it private and, and talk to Dr. Mitch directly, you can do it through our contact page at 420radio.org. There's a drop-down list there, and there'll be a line for Ask Dr. Mitch, and that'll send it to his email at 420research at gmail.com. So uh, there are lots of ways to get the information you need. But this uh, story comes from uh, theweedblog.com, and the uh, headline is Cannabis Smoking Associated with Significantly Better Health Outcomes Than Tobacco Smoking. This is from the Department of No Duh. But I just, uh, this is a study out of uh, University of New South Wales, uh, relationship between cannabis tobacco and combined cannabis tobacco use. It looks to me like it's just confirming what we've you know said before on the show. Well, we've been relying on Tashkin's data so much when we talk about uh, pulmonary impacts of cannabis versus pulmonary impacts of tobacco. And it's really nice to have this confirmed in a separate study with a separate, separate sample. And I, I uh, you know, emphasize again that, you know, smoking may not be our first choice as far as cannabis consumption is concerned, but it does not seem to lead to the pulmonary problems that tobacco smoke 
leads to, despite an overlap in, in a whole bunch of different chemicals, THC, as we've mentioned before, does not uh, increase the probability of the generation of tumors, whereas nicotine, uh, unfortunately, really does. And so uh, here's a chance to say not only is cannabis uh, better than tobacco, but in fact, uh, if you do choose to smoke cannabis, um, even though there may be more harmless ways to use it, it's not a complete disaster. All right. Skeptic420 in our chat room wants to know, and this first time I've heard this question asked, does licorice interact with cannabis? Like, does it make your heart race? As it turns out, uh, there is a a chemical that used to be in licorice that no longer is in there that was uh, linked to an increase in heart rate, but you would have had to have eaten literally uh, like half a pound of it. Um, And I'm I'm under the impression, at least, that they no longer use that chemical in the making. Uh, And, in fact, it was only in black licorice. It wasn't in red licorice. So I I don't think it'd be a big issue. Yeah, not for me, because black licorice is evil and should never be eaten by anyone. (laughs) What's up with that? Well, is is it a naturally occurring uh, licorice? So so the the organic source, some of the things that were uh, used to, to flavor black licorice back in the day did have some mild uh, tachycardia effects, would, would increase heart rate. Uh, but we're talking, you know, years and years ago. Okay. We have a call coming in from the 316 area code. You're on the air with Dr. Mitch. What's your question? Yes, I was uh, recently diagnosed with uh, active tuberculosis. And it's uh, kind of one, and I've always smoked every day, all day. I kind of wanted to know if there's, any information about vaporizing the TB or lung damage or anything really about tuberculosis and smoking cannabis or vaporizing? Well, I'm really sorry to hear about this. And obviously, uh, anything that you can do to keep your lungs healthy is going to be a, a big plus. A uh, big population study is done in South Africa, tried to link cannabis to. Uh, basically tuberculosis stuff, but it's really not a clear, definite link. Obviously, if you can turn to edibles or vaporization, it's going to have to be uh, markedly better than uh, just, you know, pure smoking. Um, But it seems unlikely that cannabis would have been the source of this tubercular reaction, uh, just given the data that we have. Okay. I was just kind of also, you'd think it would be all right. I mean, I had it for so long that I don't have a left lung no more, and I got I got to get it operated on, get the stuff cleaned out and closed up, and then I got a hole in the bronchial tube, and I got my right lung. It collapsed, but it's like it's getting better and better every day, and uh, I was just kind of afraid if it would be all right to vaporize. I'm talking like... Yeah, you're right. No, actually, with a, with a collapsed lung, you really should only only turn to edibles under those circumstances. Okay. Well, I appreciate it. Um, sure thing. Sorry to hear about this news. That's, that's really a, a drag. Yeah, thank you for your call. Uh, appreciate the call at uh, 971-533-7111. Uh, last question. Uh, oh, well, we've got two, one that just appeared, so we'll see if we can get them both in here. Uh, real quick, El Cap wanted to know, any problems using cannabis with SSRI antidepressants? I'm just I'm just not a big fan of SSRI antidepressants, and I'd prefer a behavioral intervention anyway. We haven't seen meaningful interactions between cannabis and the SSRIs. But in truth, the two-year follow-up data suggests that they're maybe 5% better than placebo. Uh, If you check out David Byrne's book, Feeling Good, or feel free to email me, and I'll send you some links to some books that can be as helpful, if not more so. All right. And finally, uh, we have a question. We've got uh, Big Daddy Fink wants to know, uh, Mom is going to be starting chemo next week. She has type 2 diabetes and have just gotten her to vaporizing. he has access to Rick Simpson oil. Can she use uh, these uh, edible oils, uh, infused oils, while doing chemo? We, we don't have any data either way, but it seems rather unlikely that they would have a negative effect. Um, again, as long as if she's got diabetes, you want to make sure you've got something good for her to eat around that's not just Twinkies. Um, 
but no, we don't we don't have any data either way. There's no compelling reason to think that it would be a, a problem. All right. Well, that's all the time we've got here for our cannabis Q and A segment with Dr. Mitch Earlywine, and he appears here every Wednesday at half past the hour. So uh, get your questions ready, and uh, we'll get them answered here. Or you can go to our contact form and send your questions directly. Dr. Mitch, thanks for joining us. We appreciate all you do. Thank you. When we come back, we've got Tracy Ansley from Moms for Marijuana, Texas. Stick around. We'll be right back after these messages from our 420 friendly sponsors. Support these advertisers because their ad money goes straight to the Russ Belleville Show. You're tuned into the Russ Belleville Show. The voice of the marijuana nation. Normal stands for responsible adult cannabis use. If cannabis use is causing problems in your life, consider taking a break or seeking medical assistance. Consider ceasing cannabis use if you have a family history of mental illness. Don't drive or operate heavy machinery while impaired.